tutorial on SAP application for the International Semantic Web Conference. Uh, I, I, I am the presenter, um, but I, this part of this material was already prepared for our previous tutorials. So the, I also collaborated with Eric, uh, Dimitris, and Yof Kaboneva. So uh, just a very short introduction. In my case, uh, I, I wrote initially a book in Spanish, uh, Web Semantica, but I also uh, wrote uh, with these other guys uh, uh, another book called Validating RDF Data in 2017. And the book is, you can buy the book, but uh, the book is also available online. Uh, so you have this HTML version that you can go to this this link there. And, and if you go here, oops, you can see the, the, the book and the, I want to activate this one. So this is the link. To the to the book to the web page of the book you can read the contents and there is also a link there to to the to the samples uh, in the book that you can take the, the samples and download the book the the samples and play with with a uh, sex or circle uh, i also have this web page in case that you are interested in more details and more publications uh, I have in the recent years, uh, we we did several publications uh, re related with this topic about sex and shackle, and that's what uh, I am going to to, teach, to talk to today. So the the contents, the topics uh, that I was planning to 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 do in this session, I uh, I will start with a very short introduction to the RDF data model, then some motivation about why we want to validate RDF data. And my plan was to to do these two sessions about sex by example and shackle by example uh, to have a, a, an overview of sex and shackle. Probably I will probably skip some of the slides here. Uh, I kept the slides in the in, in the tutorial more as a reference, but not to follow all of the, all the slides because otherwise the tutorial will be very, uh, I, I would have to go very fast uh, with the slides. So I will keep the slides here as a reference, but my plan is not to go into all the details here. And also I will I have another set where I do a short comparison between sex and circle uh, with some examples. Uh, probably I will, my, my plan here is to to do if this in more detail, and I also added for this tutorial another. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, that uh, I also have this uh, uh, about comparison between sex and circle, and and the most uh, new material in this tutorial is about uh, a topic about shapes, applications, and tools, and some challenges and perspectives about uh, validation and sex and circle. And um, this topic maybe is the most interesting topic for people who are interested uh, in research. For in this uh, semantic web conference, maybe there are people who are interested in some new challenges and and all that. So probably this is going to be the most interesting. And my plan is to have the last hour, uh, uh, the last hour of this tutorial uh, for this uh, topic for safe applications and tools because the, I think the other parts you can read the book and you can get uh, what uh, all of the contents there. Okay. So just uh, as I said, the short overview of the RDF data model. I have to go to another set of slides. So the the, the overview. This is a uh, chapter two. I mean. Uh, this is a very short history of RDF. Uh, um, probably all of you, if you are in the Semantic Web Conference, you know about this, the RDF. You, we have uh, triples, we have subjects, predicates, objects, and you can have different syntaxes of RDF. And if you have a triple, then that's a, a basic statement. You can add other triples. For example, you have L, Alice uh, is enrolled in this course, it has this name and this age, and then you can uh, add more statements statements and then later more statements and you can have cycles here so this forms a graph uh, and then you can have this graph in one part and then you can have another graph in another part and the, the nice thing about uh, RDF is that 
as the the predicates and, and the subjects and objects uh, can be URIs and URIs are global. You can merge very easily if you have uh, two RDF graphs. You can merge those graphs. So that's I think probably one of the most important uh, uh, properties of RDF is that it helps information integration when you have different uh, information on different RDF data from different sources and you can easily integrate them. So that there, are, as I said, you, you have this basic uh, R, uh, RDF syntax where you have a list of triples, but then you also have uh, another syntax which is more, uh, I mean, it's, it was more designed for for people, for human readers, which is Turtle. Um, this is more, much more readable, and I, this is the syntax that I prefer. And I wanted to, to put this slide here in this tutorial because uh, if you are able to read Turtle syntax, then you will find very easy to understand the, for example, the 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 shape expressions uh, syntax because at the end, uh, shape expressions, uh, the syntax is uh, inspired by uh, Turtle. It's a combination between Turtle, Sparkle, and um, other syntaxes. But but at the end, it is very familiar and it is just a, a continuation of this syntax. So. You know that we do have uh, several simplifications. You can simplify different things, and then you also can define uh, data types for literals. You have this also these uh, rules to simplify. For example, you have uh, if you don't put, uh, you just put a number, then this is the same as uh, as an integer. Uh, also, you have some predefined, uh, some built-in data types which usually come from XML schema. So, and this is uh, for literals. And then another topic is the blank notes. You have uh, this is the possibility to the, to say something about uh, a note that you know that it exists, but you don't know anything else. So, for example, if you want to say that Bob knows someone whose age is 23, you can say Bob knows this one, which is a blank note. So you, this is not a URI, and this blank note has an age of, of 23. So this is a, a way to, to define this. And this is usually mathematically, this is an existential quantification. So there is some X that says that Bob knows X and X has age 23. Okay, then the last thing that we have in, in RDF is uh, language tagged uh, strings. So you can say, for example, that uh, Spain has uh, two labels. Uh, one is Spain in 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 English, and the other one is España in español in Spanish. And and you have this uh, qualifier, this tag, which represents the language of this literal. So this is another thing that is built in uh, R, uh, RDF. And the, the question is, is that all? And the answer is yes. Uh, the RDF is really very, very simple, and simple is better. And I think that's probably one of the strengths of RDF is that it is a very simple uh, data model with where you have uh, uh, in the subjects, uh, in the predicates, you always have URIs. In the subjects, you can have uh, URIs uh, uh, or blank nodes. And in the objects, the end, uh, values of the triples, you can have either uh, subjects, uh, blank notes or literals. And as I said, this is uh, all. Uh, there is a, a whole ecosystem around RDF. So, I mean, that was not all, but uh, because otherwise, um, probably we wouldn't have the semantic web conference if that was all, because we also have uh, a very nice query language, which is Sparkle. We also have inference, the possibility to infer new language, uh, new, new triples uh, using, for example, RDF schema or OWL or there are other uh, inference systems. We also have uh, the possibility to have shared vocabularies. And if we put RDF uh, uh, behind uh, 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 the web and we will have what we call link data and knowledge graphs, which are uh, another variant of all this. So there is a whole ecosystem around RDF, but the idea is that the basis of RDF is are very simple. Okay. So we were here in the RDF data model. Um, and just to, to, to an overview, we have a lot of good things in RDF. Uh, so RDF is very nice as an integration language. It's 
probably the lingua franca for semantic web. Um, probably, so this is, I mean, semantic web is not just RDF, and RDF is not only for semantic web, but they are very close and very, uh, they are very good friends. So, so the RDF is important if you are in this conference. Um, also, we have RDF is very flexible. Uh, you can uh, adapt RDF to multiple environments, multiple domains. You can represent most of the information. Uh, you can represent that using RDF. In, in fact, I, I, I had never any problem to represent any information in RDF. So it's, it's very, very easy to adapt uh, data models to any, any domain. And it's reusable because it is open and it's reusable data uh, when it is represented in RDF. So it's very good for knowledge representation. And we have also very good uh, 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 technology, for example, for querying RDF, like Sparkle or RDF data stores. So th those were the good parts, but there are other parts in RDF that I think are a little bit more difficult. And I think that's the, the, the problem that we try to solve with uh, shape expressions or with Sackle is that uh, when people want to, to, to produce RDF, or they want to, to consume RDF. So when, when you are trying to use RDF uh, in practice, there are, a little, there are several problems. Uh, one of the problems is that, uh, is what I call here, that we have a lot of serializations and usually developers don't know even where to start. So, so they don't know if they're going to use the Tartel or which libraries they have to support the Tartel or this was the old way. Uh, the old school RDF was with XML, but it's uh, very difficult to, to parse RDF if it is in RDF XML. Nowadays, it is more trendy to use JSON-LD. So you have to choose between them or you have to, you can allow all of them if you just use a RDF library that supports all of them. But I mean, it's, it's a bit uh, a bit tricky to work on that. Also, to just put RDF inside HTML is not so easy. We have RDFA, we have microdata, so it's also a, 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 a lot of, another tricky point. But what the, the, the point that we are going to talk today in this tutorial is how to describe uh, RDF, or when you have uh, RDF content and you want to describe it, how, which technology you have to describe. This is, for me, one of the main important things that uh, attracted me to, to this uh, validating uh, problem. And also, if you are able to describe the data, then you can check if that data is what you were describing. If you say that you have data about a person and that person has a name and, and, uh -huh. and a birthplace, then you should be able to do just validate if that's the case. If that's the case, so that's what we call a validation. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, why describing and validating RDF? Uh, as I said here, is uh, for there are uh, two parts of this same coin. So we have, uh, if, you, if we have RDF, Imagine this is this represents uh, RDF. For example, you can have RDF data store, and there are people who are going to produce data here. So there are people who are going to add data to the RDF data store, and there are people who are going to consume this data store. So there are people who are interested to know what are here in the data store. The idea is that we are going to use shapes to describe he, what is here, what are, what, is, what are the contents of this data store. And the idea is that if we use uh, shapes, uh, then developers can, I mean, if you want to, to produce that, uh, you can understand what are the contents that you are going to produce. Um, sometimes you can say, well, but I know what we, I want to produce, so that's not at all a problem. But the problem is if you are working in a big uh, problem, in a big do domain, and you are uh, not only you, a single person, but maybe you are a team. And if you are a team, uh, maybe if you imagine that you are the, 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 the architect of the team and you have a, 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 a set of developers. And, that, and those developers, they, you want to tell those developers what is 
the content, the structure of the content that you want to produce. And for that, you need a tool that allows you to describe this content. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, we are going to use with uh, shapes. To, so we want to, to ensure that the developers, they are producing the RDF that we were expecting to produce. So that's something which is very interesting. Also, you may may want to advertise. You may want to say, "Hey, this is the, the this the, I I am going to push this RDF data store, and the, the contents of this RDF data store are uh, this." And I have a representation here of, of people and companies or whatever. So you want to, to say what is the structure of the content of of this data store, and for that we are we are going to use shapes, and also. There is another topic that I'm going to, to talk at the, in the last session is about generating interfaces. Um, so this is for producers and um, for consumers. For consumers, you just want to understand what are behind this data store. For example, uh, I think now, for example, in, in Wikidata, we have Wikidata. This is a very big, very, very big uh, data store where we put there a lot of contents and we just want to understand what are the contents that uh, are in the Wikidata. We want to to know if we are talking about a city and we want to know what is the structure or what are the properties that have cities. If we are talking about uh, people, the same. We, are, we want to know what are the properties here. So we want to verify the structure, for example, even before processing it and also in an automatic way. For example, you have a web service that is going to consume data, for example, from Wikidata and you know that uh, you're going to have a list of cities you want to know what is the structure that you expect from those cities. For example, maybe the, the cities have a property called country that refers to which country they belong to or other properties. So you want to know which what is this data structure. And finally, if you know that structure, then you can generate queries in a better way and you can even optimize how you are going to process that data. So those are the, the main motivations, I think, for, for validating and describing RDF, and I think they, is, they are quite interesting. So the, in other technologies, for example, uh, this is, I mean, what we were working in, in CPS presence and Shackle is not new. If you look at what we have in other technologies, um, for example, in relational database, you have the uh, data definition language. In XML, they did a lot of, uh, uh, how to say, a lot of recommendations, a lot of proposals uh, for for validation. You have uh, DTDs, XML schema, RelaxNG schematron. So that there were uh, several proposals in JSON. We, we, they are also uh, developing JSON schema, but for RDF. Uh, there was nothing there to fill that gap. Uh, you had ontologies, you have RDF schema, but that was not to to describe or to validate. It was more to 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 have some kind of inference. So, and that's a different topic. Okay, so just to continue to understand the, the problem. So the idea. Uh, so this is just. Uh, trying to have some kind of inspiration of what if you, we want to describe, imagine that you have this, uh, this is the, some, a very simple node, you have this RDF node, and you want to describe this. If you want to describe this, you would say, okay, I have a node, this node is uh, Alice, this is an IRI, and I have these two properties, and, and I have the value of one of the properties is always uh, if this is the name, I could say, okay, the, the value must be a, a string. And I, I can also say, okay, but uh, the, the value of nodes is not a string. The value of nodes must be another node. Okay, so Alice knows another node, so and Bob could know another uh, node, etc. So, so this is what you want to describe. So an abstract representation of that could be something like this. So you could say, okay, I have a shape where I have a node is an IRI, and I have a property name which is a string. And imagine that you can say a constraint is that I will only allow one value for this. Uh, for, for this property. So uh, imagine that in your domain, you want to say, okay, but uh, people cannot have two names. Uh, so you put this constraint. So I have only one name and then the nose, 
is the other property. It should be also in this case uh, IRI, but I could allow zero, one, or plus because maybe Bob doesn't know anyone, but uh, Alice knows Bob and knows Carol, uh, so can know two or three people. So these are the constraints. How do you put that? So this is the abstract uh, meaning of the abstract shape. How do you put that in a shape expression? So that's and this is the real. So this is the concrete concrete syntax of uh, sex. Is that you have the, the shape of a user should be a node which is a IRI and have this property which is name which is a string and knows another IRI and this star means that zero or one or more. Okay, I think so let's continue with with this uh, example about this motivation of uh, why we want uh, to to validate or, or, or how we are going to represent uh, shapes. In this case, I, I was using shape expressions, but as we will later, we will show later, Shackle is uh, very similar to this. Okay, so another topic was the, the, trying to understand the problem that we want, that we have when we want to validate is about the flexibility of RDF. RDF, RDF is uh, very flexible. Um, it doesn't put constraints, for example, in the values of properties. For example, you could have, in this case, is, uh, imagine you have a node Angie and the creator of, this is the song Angie, uh, the creator could be Keith Richards and also Mick Jagger, but imagine that you have this model where you allow either a string or a node. Uh, in this case, this is a blank node that has a first name and a last name. So this you could have a combination of a simple literal. Uh, so the proper the, this value could be a single literal, but it could also be a, a more complex structure. And there is no problem in RDF. You could define that, and the language to validate this could should allow this kind of uh, uh, combinations. Okay. Finally, there, well, finally for this motivating part is that you also have this thing about uh, repeated properties. Uh, Sometimes you could have data models in RDF where you have the same uh, property. For example, here we have product ID and product ID. This is the, the same property, but the data model that of the nodes that you are expecting of the values of this property could be different. For example, imagine that you want to say, okay, but I have one property is product ID and has, imagine that this is a book and has a ISBN. So you have the, this is a literal that has the ISBN, but then you have another product ID uh, value, which must be a string. Uh, in this case, this is an internal uh, code and has this, uh, this structure. So when you want to validate, sometimes you, you must say that you have uh, two, uh, properties, product ID with two different uh, uh, shapes. Okay, so that's the idea. So, and I put here uh, some practical examples from some for fire. You have observations and the blood pressure. You have different uh, for the same property. You have different uh, uh, observations of blood pressure. Another thing for me is is uh, interesting is that. We should separate shapes from types. Uh, uh, types come from the ontology world. Uh, and when you say that you have a node that has the type of a person uh, in the ontology world, that's uh, that's okay. But usually, uh, you could have in your domain, you could have uh, several nodes in your domain that has that same type, for example, you have uh, imagined that you have uh, uh, in a health information system, you have nodes that are uh, customers, you have also nodes that are patients, um, etc. And all of those nodes have the same type. They have the type of a person because they are all, all of them are, are people. But the data model that they have, the shape of the nodes of, is different because you could have a different shape for customers and a different shape for patients, etc. Okay, so that's the idea that uh, that's something that I think is also important to separate the the type from the shape that has the, the nodes of, with that type. Okay, and finally, and probably this is, I think this is something that probably is not easy uh, for people who were a lot of time working with ontologies and, and the semantic web conference. I think they 
at the beginning, uh, some people th thought that uh, why do you want a new language to validate uh, if we already have ontologies? Um, and I think that that has an that give uh, that gave some kind of tension between the semantic web uh, traditional uh, community and the more recent uh, people who really want to use uh, RDF for practical purposes. And the idea is that, for, for uh, as far as I can explain this, is that uh, ontologies for me they are at a much higher level. And usually, when you are thinking and when you are defining an ontology, you are thinking about your domain and you have the uh, and especially in the semantic web conference, uh, sorry, in the semantic web, in the semantic web, uh, you must think in a very open uh, way. For example, uh, you can, and especially if you link that to inference, imagine that you want to represent uh, people, uh, a person. You could say, okay, in an ontology, I can say that every person uh, has uh, two parents and exactly two parents. Uh, which are uh, people, and that's okay for an ontology. But imagine that you have, uh, uh, for example, data, and you want to validate data. You have uh, Alice. In this case, you declare that it has uh, two parents, and Bob, that has the, the, in this uh, RDF data, has only declared that has one parent, which is Dave. If you put this ontology as a constraint. The system would complain here because Bob only has uh, one parent, so uh, that that would, would complain. But uh, if you know about open world assumption in in all, here here all wouldn't complain. What he would do here is to say that uh, to to infer that Bob has one parent, which is Dave, uh, and also Bob has another parent. Which is a blank note or whatever is another note that you don't know anything about that, but he, the system would infer that Bob has two parents and one of them doesn't know who it is. Okay, so that's the idea of all. You can infer things and that's okay. I mean, in this domain, you can infer things that you you can infer that Bob has two two parents, one of them is Dave, and the other one you don't know anything. And later, if you have more information about Bob, maybe you you infer that uh, there is another parent who is 43 years old. Then you could infer that this note has an age of 43. So and that's very good for all, for because you are talking about the domain, but for shapes. What we want to do is to describe this data. We want to describe this data and we want to validate if this data we want to put, to, to put that in a data store. And for example, if you try to put that in a practical way, in trying to enforce that every node has two parents, exactly two parents, would be impossible here because th that constraint would generate an infinite value. I mean, you know, not so I, I, well, you could have uh, cycles, but you could have every node ha must have uh, two parents, and then this other node must have another two parents, and and, for, and so on. So, so trying to, um, to put that as a constraint uh, in the data uh, would, wouldn't work. So you would need to say, okay, but uh, in this data, I must allow that uh, one node has uh, two parents, another node must have one, another node maybe doesn't have any regression of parents. And that's the constraints. So for example, here in, in sex, you could say, okay, I have uh, the shape of a person, it's an IRI in this case, and has parent, and I can say, okay, but I have can have zero, one, or two parents. So, so this is the cardinality, and, and this is a way to, to put here this constraint. So for example, if you have uh, another node that, that declares that uh, it has three parents uh, in shape expressions or circle, which in a similar way would complain. But uh, circle, for example, if you declare that there are three parents, uh, what uh, all would do is to infer that two of those two parents of, of those three parents are the same one. Okay, you know, so that's the the main thing, and that's why ontologies. In my, from my point of view, ontologies are very good to do, to this. To, when you are talking about the domain and you are focused on the domain, while shapes are very good when you are focusing on the graph, on the RDF data. So, and those are uh, things that uh, are different. Um, another way to to say it is that. Uh, 
people who work with ontologies are could be the ontology engineers and people who work with shapes could be data engineers so they are more people more practical in uh, some way okay but i know that of course this is a very <laughs> rough <laughs> classification but this is a, a way of thinking about uh, this okay so just uh, uh, this is a slide. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, what the motivating part is that uh, there were other previous validation approaches, but this is the part that I will probably skip. Just to say that, uh, for example, I was doing before working on shape expressions, I also was proposing to use Sparkle to validate. But the problem of Sparkle is that it is very verbose um, and the same, I mean, trying to validate something very simple can take a lot of time. For example, this is a very simple way to validate that you have a name, which is a string, and you have maybe the, the gender, which is female or male. And try, this is the, the Sparkle query to, to try to validate this. So this is one of the problems of Sparkle. There were also another proposal with uh, Spin that also later evolved to Shackle. And also we'll have a star dog uh, that also have the, the another way and OSLC. So those are the main approaches. But there are several approaches, but later they all converge in these two main approaches, which are, I think, sex and shackle. And this is the, the topic of this validation of, of this tutorial uh, about sex and shackle. I have to say that uh, I think everything started almost in 2013. Uh, in a, there was a, a workshop about RDF validation, and the conclusion of that workshop was that there was a need of a higher level uh, language which was uh, more concise, and that language could work for RDF validation. So that was one of the conclusions of, of this workshop. Workshop, and I, I attended. I had the chance to attend this workshop. And I met there Eric Prudemou, and Eric Prudemou he was uh, already proposing uh, a language for that. And I joined efforts with with him uh, to say, okay, I will do another implementation. I was learning Scala at that moment, and so so he did an implementation in JavaScript, and I worked in another implementation of safe expressions in Scala, and we did this the, the first proposal for that then there was the w3c uh, data shapes working group that was chartered uh, one of the inputs was uh, sex uh, but there was a, there were other people who joined and there was a, a bit of a disagreement between the different approaches and, and the result of the data shapes working group was later a shackle that was accepted as a recommendation the people who were working on sex uh, had some disagreement with some of the proposals on shackle, so uh, there was a bit of a division there. Uh, later, th those two communities uh, separated. Um, uh, probably I am one of the, the guys who I try to, to to be in both sex and shackle, but most of the people are, uh, there are some people in sex and there are other people in shackle. Uh, and, and I think that's not good and probably in the future uh, the idea should be to to converge. But at this moment, that's the reality. So at this moment, uh, later uh, sex in 2017 uh, was uh, released uh, the, the, as a community. It was not a recommendation, it was a, a W3C community group draft. And later sex was adopted by, by Wikidata we, uh, and, and was I think it was a, a very good uh, thing for, for sex because uh, more people were attracted to use sex. Um, and at this moment, uh, there are a lot of use cases, as I will try to explain later, uh, using sex and all the other use cases using shackle. And, and that's, that's the reality. And I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Okay, so let's see. Uh, you were able, to, you were not able to do the. The thing is that, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, I cannot access the chat uh, for whatever reason. Ah, okay. So maybe we should start something more collaborative. Where? Thank you, Francisco. Uh, now I can hear you much better. So if you want to, to do the question, just yeah, do it. Thank you. Uh, so um, in the... Um, in the, this was related to the slide you were just basically discussing uh, uh, our versus uh, RDF. Um, basically, my my point is that I notice a lot of people, uh, 
particularly the people. So you can see in the community there is like a, a still people who believe that all two should be the modeling languages for ontologies. And there are people who are discussing the idea that basically the only thing you need is RDF plus uh, uh, some uh, validation rules like the one that you are showing today in the tutorial. And um, I was just basically uh, wondering uh, uh, basically what this is uh, uh, your position regarding that. I mean, you think that basically uh, these validation rules together with uh, with the, with RDF uh, data is just sufficient, or I think you see there's still the utility of uh, of using out. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. I was very. I was. Uh, it was interesting because my my position there is not to replace all, and my position is uh, uh, is uh, on that. Uh, I mean, I think there is a, a field for both. So, so if I go back to this slide, I think they are not contradictory, and you can have both in your problem. You can have people who, who are ontology engineers who are focused on their domain, uh, and you can have different ontologies, and you can combine uh, definitions from different ontologies. Imagine you, you have an ontology of, of people, another ontology about uh, products, uh, of, of books, and you just join uh, information from those ontologies. And on the other hand, you also have data below, and then you can have rules here, and those constraints and rules. But those rules, in my opinion, those rules are for your specific domain, or, your, or sorry, for your specific problem. So you have, uh, for example, imagine that you are working for one problem uh, where you have uh, books and people, and you want to represent the data model in that problem. And you put that, those constraints in that data model. For, imagine that's the representation that you obtain, for example, for Elsevier. You have one one publisher that has uh, people represented with some properties and, and books represented with other properties. But you also can have an ontology, which is a more general uh, ontology of people, and imagine this is uh, you have this definition of ontology uh, of sorry of shapes for Elsevier, and then you have another publisher, for example Springer, which has uh, another data modeling and another uh, different set of shapes, and you could have in that uh, different uh, problem you could have another set of uh, constraints. So from my point of view. Uh, ontologies can coexist with shapes. Ontologies should be defined in a way that have uh, less constraints and are much more reusable. And uh, shapes could be, I mean, you could have libraries of shapes, and that's something that I was planning to, to talk later. You could have libraries of reusable shapes, but uh, usually shapes are much more problem oriented. So they are. Uh, the shapes and constraints, they are usually for your particular problem and when you want to validate your particular data. While ontologies are, for example, if you have a very good ontology of, of person, uh, you could use that ontology of person and you could reuse that ontology in other different problems. Um, so I think the three have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, both ontologies, uh, shapes, and data can coexist. And here in, here in shapes, you could also have some rules. But I mean, uh, the, probably the, the problem here is where you put the rules. You could have the rules in the ontology, or you could have the rules in constraints, or you, you could have a different thing called rules where you want to infer and to infer differences that you cannot infer with with ontologies. So that's my, my point of view. I don't know if I solved the question. Yes, I just wanted just to basically challenge in this example you were showing is that basically there is the potential danger of basically ending to a situation where actually people understand the data in a different way. So basically, if you go back to your example, basically you will see that uh, uh, in the shapes, you basically you are making some assumptions. One is basically that you have unique, uh, uh, you are using, you are following the, the unique name assumption, right? So basically mm -hmm. when you just say that you have uh, two parents, uh, basically you are assuming that all the IDs in your RDF graph is actually different. So basically each ID it means basically represent a different entity. When you go to OWL, which basically doesn't follow this rule and this is open world, 
basically that implies that uh, you may be, and this is not actually wrong, you basically you say that uh, you can have only only two parents, but you have two, three individuals that basically are referred to the parent or person, then you basically you can as, assume safely that because you don't have full information about the world, about your domain, basically two of the individuals basically represent the same thing. And actually it's not wrong, it's just basically your assumption. So basically you end into the danger of basically misunderstanding of, or, assume, or making assumptions about the data that perhaps are not uh, complying with the OWL definitions or vice versa. It's not the OWL definition and not, uh, and that is actually very difficult in a, in a, in, uh, in, in a setting like this is the web and the internet where everything is distributed. And you might have people in different organizations looking at the same data, but following different constraints. So basically they imply meaning, the, impl the meaning of the data, depending on what you are following might be different in different organizations or for different people. And that is actually a bit, uh, I will say that this is uh, an implicit danger of basically uh, uh, the coexistence. Yes, but uh, I mean, that's, that's why I say that uh, you could have uh, reduce, uh, a library of reusable shapes. For example, if you are working a, in a big uh, organization where you have, uh, imagine a multinational organization where you have, uh, and you want all of the different uh, national uh, organizations to follow the same set of shapes, you could have that library of, of shapes. I mean, I know I was not saying that you are going to use your shapes in your in just your particular domain. But uh, yes, I think they are complementary. I mean, the, I think, uh, and probably, yes, uh, shapes uh, put more constraints on the things that you have in the ontology, but I think that's good. I mean, I really think that uh, that's very useful. Uh, in practice, uh, you, you need, I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, you have the, I mean, sometimes it's very useful to, to have ontologies, but uh, sometimes you want to to know, uh, to put constraints on the data that you have in your data store. Okay, so that's my point of view. So I really think that they, I mean, in practice, I think this is very useful to have uh, the three. Uh, and probably, I mean, yes, it's possible that you have, you could have assumptions, different assumptions, uh, okay, and that's. Uh, I'm, I mean, in the last part when I was uh, I was going to talk about uh, how I use saves, for example, for continuous integration. Uh, I think if you have a, uh, if you are working with continuous integration, you could have saves which are compatible with with ontologies. And in, in fact, I use saves uh, to validate ontologies also. But maybe that's for a different topic. So maybe I, I can talk it about that later. Okay, but I, I partially you. agree with that. Okay, okay, let's continue. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, so. That